Hey friends, David Tenson with you. Um, in just a minute or so, I'm going to be answering some questions live. Um, what I'm going to do is just notify some of those people who uh, wanted to know that uh, when we were going live. So I'm just going to um, share that link with them and then we are going to um, get, get going on a really exciting uh, number of questions that, um, that we've got uh, ready for today, which is just going to be really good. Some, some really good um, questions were submitted. So um, thank you so much to everybody who wrote in. Uh, you'll see in the text what those questions are. So if you do want to check out what those questions are, they're in the description here. And uh, in just a minute, I'm going to be working through um, through what some of those questions were. And uh, I know you'll be super blessed by that. So just sending out uh, this message to everybody who wanted to know about it. That's all done. And uh, we're going to get going soon. Good to see you there, Aaron. Thank you for, for tuning in. Uh, Linda, Julie, bless you. Uh, Raylene. Um, it's going to be uh, an amazing uh, little time together. Melissa, bless you heaps. You'll notice if I touch my phone, it's sort of uh, jumps around a bit. So I'm going to try and limit limit that as, as much as I can. <laughs> uh, so, all right. Um, good to good to have you all here. Do let us know where you're tuning in from. I know it's uh, it's it's late uh, in the evening in the states uh, and mid morning here in Australia. Um, but we had a, a couple of really good questions uh, come in. And by the way, feel free to share this if you like as well. Um, hope you can hear me okay as well. We got we got some great questions here um, that I I thought would just be really good to to flesh out um, and and to share. So let me bring those questions up here. Uh, I'm using pseudonyms, which are which means they're they're not real. They're not really their names. But here's here's a really good question uh, from from Jill. Jill asks. Uh, you've separated yourself from your dysfunctional family. You don't ever want to be like them, yet you find there are traits in you that are similar to them. You kind of beat yourself up about it. And her question is, how do you identify the un underlying reason and overcome it? I'm sure it's some something, it's some deep root in the soul that's not healed. Thanks. That's a really good question. Um, and I'm sure it's a, a common uh, question. It, it certainly has been in my years of doing this. It's certainly been part of my, my, um, my healing journey is this separation um, from maybe not just dysfunctional families, but also dysfunctional um, people um, from dysfunctional communities, from dysfunctional churches, from, you know, it, it can we can find people groups that are dysfunctional everywhere. Um, but the truth is we're not all fully functional ourselves. Um, and so how do you walk through this? Now, there are a lot of things that sort of will come up um, with a question like that. And, and, and if I was to sit here with Jill, I'd be drilling into what does that look like? What is it that you, that you don't like about yourself? What the, what's sort of a dysfunctional um, family was it because a lot of things can occur in a dysfunctional family. Um, there are particular roles that we all play in dysfunctional families. Some of us play the jester, some of us play the rescuer, some of us are the noble martyrs, some of us are the rebels. You know, there there are all kinds of hats that we can wear to cope and deal with living in dysfunctional families. And sometimes we never take those hats off because we're so used to wearing them, but they don't bring us freedom because um, they they rob us from relationship and and I guess this is um, really if, if we're going to talk dysfunctional families or families at, at all there is this scripture that I often hear quoted from people who are are caught up and are, are really being hassled in a dysfunctional family and that scripture um, is from Exodus 20:12, where it says, "Doesn't the Bible say that you, in the Ten Commandments, that you were to honor 
your mother and father. Um, it appears again in Ephesians 6. So let me read it from Ephesians 6, um, 1 to um, uh, 5. It's probably good. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Obey them. Okay? Children. Children. Not adult children. Little children. Obey because this is right. Honor your mother, your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise. If you look through the commandments, that's a commandment with a promise. Good deal. That it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. So there is, I'm just going to bring it up here on my screen, but there is, there is a lot around that. After that, it says, fathers, do not provoke your children to anger. Okay. Don't provoke them to anger. Why? But bring them up in the discipline and the instruction of the Lord. So there's a responsibility that jumps immediately to fathers to do something about the formation of the child. So a lot of us may not may not have had that. You know, uh, I'm a father and there are times I just suck at that. Um, <clears throat> but what about this honor thing? And what a lot of us hear when, when we, we've either been had this drilled into us through uh, I think a misuse of the word um, through some poor teaching that honoring your mother and father means you have to listen to them means you have to obey them um, that you have to um, um, behave in a way that they always tell you to um, and that we're to not only do that but we're to honor their behavior and, and here is where things get a little bit murky. If you look at the word honor in the Hebrew, the word is kabad. K-A-B-A-D is one of the uh, common spellings of it in English. K-A-B-A. It's, it's a heaviness. It's an honor. It's, it's, it's also sometimes used in this word glory. Um, and and what, what, we're, what kabad means is, is it, it means to give weight to something. It means to make noble, okay? It means to accept, to consider, and to bless. So, it doesn't mean to obey. It means to bring respect, to bring honor and weight. And one of the things that happens when we work through some of these challenging things of trying to nut out, how do I now, as an adult child, um, carve out a future of my own that is unlike my old dysfunctional upbringing. That's that's common. I, I think that's a noble goal, and all of a sudden we want to um, we want to do this. Good. That's a good thing. The challenge is is that unless we honor our parents, if we honor our mother and father in this way. Um, life won't go well with us. That that's one issue to consider here. Now, what does honor mean? And and, um, and there is a great teaching. I'm going to always flag that. Wave the flag of the the pioneering work that John and Paula Sanford did, and all the team at Elijah House Ministries. That that um, they get a great teaching on honoring mother and father, and and they spell out and they they highlight the fact that what we are to honor in our parents is is their personhood. Okay, we're honoring their personhood, we're honoring their position, we're honoring their identity. Okay, their personhood, their identity, who they are in Christ, who they are, and, and the position that God placed them as your parents. God placed them, He chose. If you believe that you are predestined, chosen by God, planned for to be alive for such a time as this, as I think Ephesians 1 spells out and other parts of scripture, then he must have also chosen your parents. Now that's hard for us to think about sometimes, but he doesn't choose based on behavior. Yeah, uh, he chooses because he loves. And we are to honor personhood, position, identity. However, it doesn't mean that we must honor, give weight to, and respect the behavior of parents and dysfunctional family members. Well, you don't have to honor their performance or their behavior. Your mum or dad may have sucked at being a mum or dad. Full stop. They may have been terrible. They may have left you. They may have been abusive. There must have been there could have been a whole stack of stuff that happened. Which 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 you do not need to honor. 
So what do you do with it then? And that's that's the question. That's where we get to inner healing. Okay, if I don't have to, if I have to honor who they are, but I don't have to, to tolerate their behavior, it's like, as much as a strange saying it is, love the love the person but not the sin. So I can honor the position, the personhood of my mother and father or family members or church members or anyone in my life. However, I don't have to honor their behavior. Yeah? I don't have to honor their the performance, so to speak. Um, so that's where we I often will start with that. And so I would say to 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 Jill who who's asked this question, you've separated yourself from your dysfunctional family, you don't ever want to be like them, uh, yet you find that there are traits similar in you. Um, how, you know, and you've beat yourself up about it. So there's this thing of honor, Jill, you want to look at and consider. The second thing you want to consider, and again, I'm going to draw from some really good um, teachings from uh, Elijah House here, um, is, is this, this whole idea of, of when we judge. Okay, when we judge our mother and father, um, when we judge other people, that judgment is um, going to come back to us. Yeah, Scripture says that um, God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, that he will reap. And in a number of times, Jesus talks in the Gospels and, and explains this mystery um, of when we judge and measure judgment out, it's measured against us. Okay, so you've got a principle of sowing and a reaping, a principle of judgment and return from those things. Okay, so there, there are two, two things here. Um, and we know if, the, if I judge another person as being out of a place of bitterness, out of a place of pain, out of a place of accusation, not sober assessment, but often painful accusation, then what happens is, it's it's as if a dark seed is planted, a weed is planted in the garden of our heart, and it begins to slowly, slowly multiply and reap a harvest in our life. And, um, and this is one of those things that I've prayed with thousands of people through, I'm running a demo um, demonstration um, classes at the moment. And just last night, somebody that I prayed with uh, and we worked through this with, we uncovered a, a judgment that, that they'd had and um, on a parent and it was affecting their marriage. So if I've judged my mother as being something um, or my father as being something, if, I will reap that in my other relationships because as it's, as we judge, it's judged. Now it's not God working against us. Here's Jesus explaining how life works. Okay. So, so another scripture for, for, for that, um, is in Hebrews, uh, 12, 15. And in it here, the writer of Hebrews, whoever that is, says to us, see that no one fails to obtain the grace of God and that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble and by it many are defiled. And so we, we also have, Jill, I would be looking at ways that you've judged your parents. Um, and, and often that is the other side of forgiveness. We can forgive them for the wound, but if we do not repent for our sinful response, that pattern will perpetuate in our life. And it's quite a profound um, thing. And, and the other things are the classic vows. You might have heard of the, the, the term of, of inner vows. And, and Elijah House have shared this, but quite a number of inner healing teachings. And, and even outside of that, <coughs> um, one of the popular scriptures to do with salvation is that if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, you're saved. So you have a, a heart belief and a mouth confession that brings into existence and brings into play um, an, an amazing dynamic in your life that we most Protestant Christians and Catholics and people of, of this faith believe that this is how we move into or at least begin the salvation thing. This is important that I confess that Jesus Christ is Lord and believe in with that he was risen in my heart. I need to believe the, the gospel narrative and, and the position of Christ. Now, we have to then understand that here is something very powerful and I think, unfortunately, the Word of Faith movement um, pushed this a little too far. But there is a truth that comes to 
confessions that we make and vows that we believe um, uh, when we come into agreement with something, that I confess it and I believe it. Now, we can do that with a whole lot of stuff. And one of the most popular things is um, the, the vow or the promise we make to ourselves that I'll never be like dad. I will never be like mum. I'll never be like my parents. And then we find out because we're flesh of their flesh and bone of their bone that we are like them. And now we've got a problem because what we have hated in the other, we find in ourselves. Give us a, that's me, or type something in of, yes, that's me. If you have made that vow, I'll never be like mum and dad, or I'll never be like them. And you found that you are like them. It's, it's, if ever I've done this in a class, it is full. Thumbs up. Yeah, I've said that. I'm never going to be like that. And then I find I'm like that. I'm never going to discipline my kids like my dad. And then I do it. You know, it can even be silly things. Oh, they laugh like an idiot. And then I find myself laughing in exactly the same way. And, and here's the reason it's important to love and to honor the humanity and personhood of another. But it's important for us to realize that, that these vows hold immense power. And if, if Jill, the person who's asked this question, if you have made this, this promise to yourself and this promise about life um, that you're never going to be like that, then I, you, need, you know who you need to be like? You need to be like you. You need to be like you. This is the freedom that Christ came to set you free for, to give you honor, to put honor and glory on your personhood and on who you are, regardless of the stage and age um, and, and place you are in your journey in life and in faith and in family and everything. He places honor and glory uh, upon you. He honors and he loves you. And our journey is to learn that, that I am loved and I am honored by God. Um, and so are my parents and so is my family and so are my friends and so are my enemies. They are made in his image too. And it's my role to honor not only my personhood, but theirs. So I would look at those inner vows and promises you may have made to yourself here as well. I want to keep in mind too, and I want everybody to understand as I'm sharing today, and I should have started with this disclaimer, but the, this is all just suggestive advice. I'm using some scripture here from a, a pastoral and spiritual perspective. If you've got some big challenges here, find a professional a certified or notable professional counselor, prayer minister, psychologist, anything if you've got some big, big um, challenges and issues here. These people are trained to help you walk through this. Okay. Um, you would also, though, let's say you, you, you work through some of that stuff. A question I have is, well, do I have to jump back into a relationship with people who have been harmful, who have been abusive, who I don't feel relationally safe around? And I can't answer that for you, but let, let me just point you towards some resource or give you some things to consider about after I take this brief water break. How's it all going? You enjoying this, guys? <coughs> and some coffee. All right. I want you to consider um, boundaries, okay? Think about boundaries. Um, Dr. Um, Henry Cloud has done some great work on boundaries, okay? Look up cloud boundaries, if you like cloud in the sky. If you Google that, you'll find some remarkable stuff. Uh, I know um, Danny Silk has done some material around that as well in his Keep Your Love On series. Um, you have to do you well, Jill. You have to keep doing you well, all right? Um, responsibility. You have a responsibility to yourself and your family. If you have a family and extended family is unsafe, you have a responsibility as a parent to, uh, you know, to parent well and to, to keep children in a safe environment. We all do, Okay. Don't don't be led into um, the demand or or um, 
I, I think it was Jung or maybe even, I think it was Carl Jung or someone in that era talked about the family trance. We can get sucked back into it and maybe even religious things. You need to honor your mom and parent. You have to turn up this. No, you have a free will choice and it's your free will choice that will ultimately bring you a great sense of, of freedom and choice and safety in in your um, family and in that those dysfunctional relationships. Um, I love the idea of... Um, of differentiation okay now differentiation is is um, a term uh, I think it was coined by um, Murray Bowen and um, and and it's just a, a great uh, terminology where where you, I mean this is what you want to work towards is that you do you well you manage you well you regulate your own emotions well okay um, and and you you honor and take a sense of responsibility around your own personhood. Just um, I wrote a, a blog called Maturity and the Prayer that produces it. Uh, it's at davidtenson.com, and in it I um, I touch on this this idea of um, of differentiation. I believe I did in here, but you can look that up. And that that's some great. There's a guy called Jerry Wise as in wise as in wisdom on YouTube who has some really really good stuff on family dynamics very very good uh, he's a Christian guy really really good very solid he's a therapist he's trained do the work of separation so that you can be you okay um, and you're hard, you're probably being hard on yourself Jill because you're hard on them and as long as you hate it in them you're gonna hate it in yourself and so this is where this journey of forgiveness and release and repentance that and and seeing the promises you made to yourself to protect yourself uh were there so i hope that helps with your question uh jill uh, i'm just going to bring up the the next question how are we going for time this has been really long my gosh anyway you're still around some of you i'm gonna spend just the last 10 minutes on this question which is interesting. Do I have to deal with inner healing to have physical healing happen? Do I have to deal with that to have physical healing happen? No. That, although that's a very strange, it's not a complete question. When do I have to deal with inner healing to have physical healing happen? Might be something. But So the answer is, um, to have physical healing, you don't have to deal with inner healing. Not exclusively. But sometimes that's the key, yeah. And on the, in a broader picture, you can't separate emotional uh, and physical inner healing stuff from one another. You you are you are an intentionally made being who who has a soul, who has a spirit, who has a body, and they're intertwined. So it's inseparable. If you are physically healed by whatever manner through 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 medicine through surgery through miracle through lifestyle choices whatever that is that is going to affect your emotion and your mood your physiology and of course affect your whole being including your your spirit um, because they're inseparable but sometimes um, we know that um, they are inner emotional issues that cause outer outer pain yeah body based pain can be an indication of of inner issues and vice versa okay but you all still have to make lifestyle choices dietary choices sleeping choices that are wise if you want to care for your body so um is there grace for that? Have I seen God heal people that have abused their body? Yes, there is. But there is wisdom in the go and sin no more either, right? Um, so this is what I know, and, and this is important, I guess, if you, you're looking at, at both. And, and, and I've prayed for people with inner healing stuff, and I've had people with big eye problems, no longer need glasses, I've seen the healings. I've 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 seen all that stuff. Okay, major back pain healed. All sorts of stuff in in the healing session. But here's the thing: we never went after that. 
physical healing. We went after greater connection. And this is the thing that's a bit of a misnomer around prayer ministry and inner healing. It, it, it Ultimately, what if you sit in a session with somebody, you, you want to... Well, this is, this is my approach. I, I want the person that I'm with to end up more connected to God, more connected to themselves, more connected to others, more connected to life. I want to increase connection and, and work with Jesus on removing blockages that, that are stopping that connection, okay? Because disconnection um, is, is actually a terrible thing because we're made for connection. God himself is relationship and connection. So anything that I can do to increase um, um, connection with God Self, as we talked about in the last thing, that Jill has a problem with connection to herself. Life and others, we're going to work. I believe Christ came and, and, and God is a, in a restorative um, uh, mode, <laughs> mood, um, to do all those things. That, that's, what, that's what Christ came for, to demonstrate and to show. And so, um, in that, having said that, if any healing... If good inner healing leads to greater connection, um, there are so many studies that show that because to me the opposite of connection is isolation and loneliness. There, there was a study done, and uh, you can look this up um, uh, a number of years ago, I think it's less than a decade ago, on the epidemic of loneliness. And I think they studied over 350,000 people and studied what's the health what is the health okay so we're talking physical what's the physical health of people that are lonely and um and they posited that they, they sort of concluded that um isolation can be as detrimental to our health as smoking if not more so you could be a smoker in community with friends and be healthier than a, a well good eating non-smoker who lives in isolation because we're made for connection, okay? Um, it, it, it helps the immune system and, and countless studies have been done to that. So to answer the question in a, in a different way, any healing can lead to physical healing, especially where there are parts of isolation that have caused our entire bodily system to lower in immunity lower in what naturally should occur when we're in relationship with God, self, others, and and life. So that's how I would answer that. A challenge with any healing stuff is sometimes it just takes a while to find out what's wrong. And, and, um, and I remember sitting with somebody who was um, a leader in the healing rooms movement, and they were saying how more and more people are coming in with emotional challenges. And the appointments they had had to go longer because it took so long to find out what the problem was. And um, and this is the hard, you know, if you find a professional, if you find somebody who's trained, they'll help you pinpoint some common things. But the Holy Spirit can show us. Um, what I have found, though, is that revelation usually lands and sticks on prior knowledge. Yeah. So... Uh, for me in my life and, and the space that I work in, uh, there's a whole stack, the, the realm of possibility, the realm where revelation can fall on and the Holy Spirit can speak to me about is, is, is broad and wide. So if, you, if you, you want to know, be diligent, study, get teachings, um, go, go find a professional or somebody that's trained to help you identify what, the, what could happen and the Holy Spirit may just whisper to you and you find that perhaps, yeah, your physical healing is is connected to your emotional. And the, the other way around, because again, we can't be separated, sometimes we create extra emotional problems by focusing on the illness. There's a, something called somatic symptom disorder, and it happens when we're focusing so much on a particular pain that it causes emotional stress and distress and other types of problems. So now it's not just one thing, it, all the stress and distress of that one thing have perpetuated in ourselves and maybe others to cause more sickness. So um, 
that's it for today. Thanks everybody for tuning in. Uh, there, if I'm going to stick around for two more minutes, if there is a last minute question, if not, feel free to to sign off here. Um, this will be recording. Can I encourage you though to go to my website if you want to know more about inner healing? If you want to see me do this, if you want to get involved, we have a um, a course. It's the demonstration course. I'll put the link in this description um, across June. It's gonna. We've got new openings for June. You may even get opportunity for me to sit with you and pray with you through some stuff in the demonstrations. Um, uh, and so they are two-hour live sessions, 10 o'clock every Wednesday at 10 o'clock Australian time, which would be 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time in the States. Uh, across June, um, sometimes you may watch me work and pray with somebody else, and you'll you'll um, learn a lot there, um, and you may even get opportunity to receive ministry as well. But shalom, bless you. If don't see any more questions. Thanks for submitting them. I might come back in a couple of weeks again um, to uh, to answer some more questions. If you still want to use that link that I've used in the last video to answer to ask a question, you can click on there. It'll open up Messenger and send you to. Um, a place to ask questions from. Shalom. Blessings. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace and health and wholeness in mind, body and spirit.